Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Welcome back to War and Peace. I'm your host, Olga Olaker, still in my remote home studio. And I'm Hugh Pope in northern Brussels. And with us virtually today, we have Andrew Watkins, our Crisis Group Senior Analyst for Afghanistan. Welcome, Andrew. Hi, everyone. And thank you both for having me today. You know, we mostly focus on Europe and Eurasia region, but Afghanistan is far from irrelevant. So what we thought we would do with this episode is talk to Andrew about the role of the country countries, Europe and Eurasia in Afghanistan, and Afghanistan's impact on them. But before we do that, I think we can't not ask, what is the situation with COVID-19 in Afghanistan? What kind of a threat does the country face? And how are Afghanistan authorities responding? The situation in Afghanistan is both alarming and perplexing at the same time. The Afghan government's own Ministry of Public Health, as well as various UN agencies and public health experts globally, are concerned not only about the health effects of the pandemic and its possible spread across Afghanistan. Some numbers concern about infection are as high as 25 million potential infected Afghans out of the country's estimated population of 35 to 40 million people. And even only considering the possibility for a 5% mortality rate, that's truly staggering. There are also concerns about second and third order effects when it comes to especially poverty and food insecurity. The loss of remittance wages from large numbers of Afghans who work in neighboring countries or further abroad, the spillover impact from neighboring countries like Iran that has been particularly hard hit, but also increasingly Pakistan and South Asian neighbors, and the impacts of the government response itself, lockdown measures cutting off an economy that in large part still relies on the informal sector and day labor, people just unable to make the money that puts food on the table day to day. At the same time, the spread of the virus is difficult to track because of how limited and how weak the infrastructure of public health truly is in Afghanistan. And so numbers that come out are small and feedback from local communities is very difficult to string together into anything like reliable quantitative health monitoring data. Some people say that the spread is much slower than expected. Others are attempting to explain why the virus hasn't had the impact that we expected yet. What we do know is that even with very limited testing, the numbers continue to rise. And as we've seen in places like India, where even a month ago, the effects were perceived to be quite limited and there must be some sort of X factor, we're now seeing health infrastructure overwhelmed. I'm worried that that's what's coming for Afghanistan soon. Yeah, I mean, I recall one of the achievements in Afghanistan was improving access to healthcare, but it was improving access to very basic healthcare, right? That there's somebody that one can get to to set a bone. It isn't that there's somebody one can get to who will put you on a ventilator. So I think that really speaks to just how limited the access is for most citizens and most residents. Yes, absolutely. And unfortunately, the further out that you get into the rural areas of Afghanistan, and 75% of the population still does live in rural areas, you have a great deal of the health services provided actually coming from international organizations or from foreign funded aid and the disruptions to donor countries and their own need to respond and what that does to the logistics of providing aid in a conflict zone like Afghanistan are only further disrupting that already very basic level of service. So let's talk about food security. Afghanistan's own capacity to produce food, its agriculture was decimated by the war in the 1980s, the Soviet Afghan war, and has never recovered because, well, Afghanistan entered into a period of conflict. So where does Afghanistan get its food? Afghanistan brings in even its most basic foodstuffs and its most basic household items from neighboring countries or from longer supply lines. 
such as India or China or elsewhere. I think more than two thirds of Afghans consume a household diet of five ingredients or less. And there's an alarming number of Afghans that consume a diet of only three basic daily items, which is wheat flour that is turned into bread, cooking oil, and sugar. Wheat flour, cooking oil, and sugar all need to be imported into Afghanistan. Afghanistan cannot produce these to meet domestic needs on its own. It does produce a certain amount of wheat. Where Central Asia comes in is Kazakhstan, and its wheat outputs actually make up the majority of wheat flour imports for Afghanistan. And they have for most of the last decade, if not longer, I believe. So what's happened? How has that been disrupted by COVID? Uh, it's been disrupted quite a bit. Fortunately, the Afghan government had invested with the help of international aid in a fairly robust emergency grain reserve. And so it was able to step in as COVID-19 related disruptions immediately kicked off. But one of the first things that Kazakhstan did was cut off its exports of wheat and grain and other basic foodstuffs out of concern for its own domestic strategic reserve and concerns about domestic supply. That happened fairly early on in March. We've since, through April, seen the Kazakh government relax in place strict quotas at one point, saying that it would only export a very limited amount. We've seen those quotas raise a bit, and we have hopes that they'll continue to raise. But then we also have concerns about the tightening of borders, not just the wheat suppliers, but those countries that share land borders with Afghanistan. There's not much trade that goes through Turkmenistan, but when you talk about Uzbekistan and Tajikistan- There's some trade that goes through Turkmenistan, it's just not food. Uh, right, right. Not much licit. So when you talk about the countries that these goods and foodstuffs have to travel through, they have locked down their borders incredibly tightly. Now, the Afghan government and these governments, as well as some of Afghan's international supporters, have lobbied to keep commercial trade open to the extent that it's possible. But as we've seen all across Afghanistan's customs crossing points, delays have resulted, slowdowns, stoppages, concerns about the spread of the virus's infection, even just the slightest hiccups to Afghanistan's food supply as people's daily incomes are drying up due to the econ economic impact. Even temporary hiccups are really alarming in a country that already has 12 to 13 million food insecure. Andrew, this is all alarming sounding stuff, but what we normally hear from Afghanistan is talk of war. If you are in Afghanistan at the moment, the Afghan government or people trying to help, what is the priority problem? Is it COVID? Is it the food security? Or is it actually still the war? This is an important question. Several colleagues in Kabul, whom I've been keeping in touch with closely, have said that when they speak to residents, whether it's in Kabul or across the country, some have the attitude that if the international community had not made such a big deal of COVID-19, and if it weren't in the news every night, we might not have noticed it because death is such a feature and facet of our everyday life, that if those who are most vulnerable in our communities began to die, it might not have made the same impact that all of you in, in your safer homes seem to think that it has. And that's just one perspective, but it's certainly a vein of thought among Afghans. So that means the war is front and foremost in most Afghans' minds. Yes, the war and the violence in particular, given the way that the peace process or the attempts to start a peace process have developed in the last few months. COVID's also, it's shut down trade, it's shut down the movement of people. Has it also shut down the peace talks? I mean, there were kind of ebbs and flows of activity over the last couple of years. Has it largely stopped with the pandemic? Unfortunately, the pandemic may have been a problem were the peace process really moving forward and progressing but it has been more fits than starts in the last several months. Since the 29 February agreement signed between the US and the Taliban, there has been a number of issues that have had more influence over the peace process or a lack of movement in the peace process to the point that the practical difficulties caused by COVID-19 haven't even become an issue yet. The Afghan government was split amongst itself and the political landscape in Kabul divided. The Taliban only 
24 hours after it signed the agreement with the United States, immediately resumed violence and began attacking Afghan security forces. All parties to the agreement voiced disagreement and confusion over the terms of an agreed prisoner exchange. And so there were so many issues that popped up right away. There was worry that COVID-19 would interfere in the logistics of peace talks, but we haven't even moved to a point where they seem feasible yet. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. You're listening to War and Peace, and Hugh and I are talking to Andrew Watkins, our senior analyst for Afghanistan. So what are the prospects for getting the peace talks back on track at this point, either still with COVID or without? Is anybody trying to do anything? Yeah, the prospects are unfortunately still very low. And that became apparent to anyone who was watching Afghanistan in the days and weeks following this agreement between the US and the Taliban, which spread a lot of hope and optimism and perhaps unrealistic expectations about what a peace process might entail. These challenges that I just shared, the resumption of violence, disagreements over how to even begin confidence building measures, the very beginnings of a peace process are already so difficult and with so many objections. The U.S. has continued to try and push, for its own domestic political reasons, it seems, a quick and steady pace of movement forward to initiate talks between the Taliban and the Afghan government to move forward on peace. But it's getting resistance from so many angles that it's really hard to tell if talks will even begin at this point. In one of the many briefings that you've been writing for Crisis Group, one of the suggestions you made that there should be a neutral mediator that could come in and perhaps help things along. Who were you looking at for that? Were you thinking perhaps of Russia, which had a role last year? That's a great question. When we talk about a neutral mediator, Russia is not at the top of the list Crisis Group's preference would be for a country that does not have such a prominent role in the 40 years of Afghan conflict as the former Soviet Union did some decades ago that would be viewed with mistrust and a number of intense sentiments by a large number of Afghans, both on the Afghan government supporting side and the Taliban. So Russia may be reasonably neutral on who comes out on top now, but it's not seen as neutral by the people of Afghanistan. Is that about right? Right, that's correct. And there's also the question of Russia being perceived as contrary to many of the United States interests. And if it's in the United States interest that the peace process proceeds in one direction, there have been signs at time that Russia might be interested in teasing with alternative directions. One example is in February of last year, Moscow hosted an informal or track two dialogue of Afghan political leaders and the Taliban, which was a historic meeting and undertaking. The only problem was it wasn't coordinated with the United States that was concurrently speaking to the Taliban to come to its own arrangement. And it also didn't invite the Afghan government which was widely viewed as delegitimizing of the government in Kabul and also furthered the divide between different politicians. Were they not invited or did they refuse to attend? Well, the Taliban has long rejected the idea of negotiating with the Afghan government in Kabul, viewing it and describing it as a puppet of the United States. And so the United States had been dealing with the Taliban directly in order to build up to the point where the Taliban would accept talks with Kabul. And so Russia's invitation that did not include to the government of Kabul because the Taliban would not agree to it, it created a bit of confusion. That said, that's one of a few things where Russia has done things that were contrary to America's preferred preferences and how to move forward on peace. But by and large, Russia, along with other regional powers, has been supportive, both in rhetoric and substance, of moving towards the basic goal of a political settlement. If not Russia is the neutral mediator in question, then was there someone else you were thinking of? There have been a number of nations that have voiced interest in hosting, including one of the Central Asian neighbors, Uzbekistan. A number of them, five countries that have expressed some degree of interest, Uzbekistan, Germany, Norway, Indonesia, And I'd have to check one other, I believe it's the Philippines, prominent members of the Organization of Islamic Cooperation have all been interested in playing a supporting hosting role. While all of these countries can claim varying degrees of neutrality, Germany obviously is a member of the NATO mission. 
that supports the U.S. efforts there. And even Norway has been a troop contributor to that mission for some time. One other factor to consider beyond neutrality is a country's experience in hosting and facilitating peace processes. So while Uzbekistan might be able to fit the bill of neutrality, it doesn't have as much experience in the international arena and might need the support of outside bodies or further assistance to really mediate and facilitate. So Uzbekistan has been increasingly active, right? Uh, over the last few years, it's had a change of government and it's really looked to end its own previous isolation, build a new Central Asia, revamp trade in Central Asia. If Uzbekistan succeeds in that, what does that mean for Afghanistan going forward? Is that good for Afghanistan? How does Afghanistan fit in? I wonder if the better question might not be to flip that. Depending on what the future of Afghanistan is, would that pose a much greater threat to Uzbekistan's plans and ambitions for the region? Depending on what state the region and its security environment is in over the next few years, I would think that that would have a great effect on what Uzbekistan is able to accomplish. How bad can Afghanistan get, given that it's really pretty bad already? And it's been pretty bad for a very long time. I mean, how much can it really upend other people's plans if they can insulate themselves from it? That's a great question. And that's exactly where I was heading. The concern at the moment is signaling and political rhetoric from the United States that it is considering a military withdrawal from the country and perhaps a rather rapid and sudden one. One, even if the peace process does not continue to move forward. One thing to consider and that Crisis Group has looked at is the potential for a rapid and sudden American withdrawal of its military troops and presence, which if it took place would also probably correspond with a dramatic decrease in international aid and funding to the Afghan state. That could be potentially destabilizing. While I don't want anyone to assume that would automatically mean the Taliban would victoriously march back into Kabul, there's some question as to whether or not that would even be possible. But we do believe that if things fall apart in the peace process or if the United States backs away from Afghanistan in a sudden or dramatic way, imagine border crossing points between Uzbekistan and Tajikistan simply losing Afghan border police altogether. There are remote parts of these borders and there are regions where we know that smuggling and illicit trade takes place. But imagine if the highways and the major boarding crossing points were to simply disintegrate or fall into the hands of local warlords, illicit taxation, or, or even violent contestation. I believe it was 2018 when skirmishes between Afghan forces and the Taliban actually got so bad along the border with Tajikistan that airstrikes that some analysts believe to be Russian Air Force airstrikes impacted the border regions between the two countries. Imagining a situation where all states in the Central Asian region felt threatened by Afghanistan's disintegration of borders or of law and order that sounds very destabilizing to whatever Uzbekistan has planned for the region. One thing that hasn't come up in the conversation so far at all is any question of Europe. And yet uh, many of these Afghans who are already leaving Afghanistan and many in Turkey and many are trying to get across the various crossing points into Europe. It would seem that Europe would have a big interest in what's going on there, but you haven't mentioned it. Does that mean to say it's just not a significant player? No, that's a great question. And I don't want to give that impression because it obviously is not, not only as a donor country, but because of the number of European countries that are still invested in the military troop presence that is led by the US, but also engaged in diplomatic efforts. Norway's cultivation of relationships with all sides and all parties in the Afghan conflict and its political landscape have been invaluable. Germany's as well on the diplomatic front, as well as the fact that Germany's military still administers the northern regional command of the international troop presence in Afghanistan. And of course, the EU itself as a donor and as a supporter of the Afghan government and of aid and development. The issue today and what has been the issue since the US really stepped up its efforts to negotiate with the Taliban bilaterally is that European donors and military partners and diplomats 
are often reliant on responding to the latest U.S. move. And part of that is born out of the practical reality that if the U.S., as it did in February, agrees with the Taliban to a timeline for troop withdrawal, the NATO presence made up a number of other contributing countries cannot sustain itself. So even if European nations were to choose a different alternate path, practically speaking, they simply couldn't maintain it if the U.S. decides to leave. And so you have the U.S. in the driver's seat, so to speak. With many European nations, and crisis group has been told by a number of European diplomatic officials, frankly, that they are waiting to reformulate their Afghanistan strategy based on where the United States comes out as this peace process continues to try to move forward. So the U.S. presence and prospects for the U.S. absence have an impact on how peace talks will go. Is the U.S. helping or hurting in Afghanistan overall, the kind of the peace process aside? Is it keeping the lid on things? Is it making it worse? Do more people die because of Americans or do more people live because the Americans are there? This has been a question for the last 18 years. It's a difficult one. Well, and I think it's changed over the last 18 years, at least a little bit. Yeah. Absolutely. I think it's fluctuated quite a bit. From a strictly military analysis, the country's conflict is barely resting at a stalemate, but a stalemate that just barely tips in the Taliban's favor. And the country's conflict is measured by lethality. The number of people total who have been killed and injured over the last two years has risen to record levels. A number of conflict monitors measure Afghanistan as the world's deadliest conflict. And that has been in large part, not solely, but in large part due to the United States intensifying its aerial bombardment of Taliban areas. And that has corresponded with a growth in civilian casualties. There's been recent New York Times reporting asking the question, if tens of thousands of Taliban fighters have died over the last decade, how on earth is this group still powerful enough to control roughly half the country and, and to contest a military superpower? And part of the answer is that in a society like Afghanistan, where family networks are still the primary bind of communities. When a U.S. bombing campaign wipes out whole families, whole villages, or great number therein, it contributes to incredibly negative long-term impacts. As opposed to all the places where killing a whole lot of families is a positive, but sorry. No, right. <laughs> I, I, but the, the long-term impacts really do equate into significant and reasonable grievances against the United States and the military presence there. I think that makes it so important for the United States to remain committed. This track of peace that it has set itself on is one way, if not to resolve all of Afghanistan's many deep problems, at least to stem the flow of violence, as terrible as it has grown over the last few years. But it's in such a precarious position, the, the country's conflict and its political dynamics. The worst thing we could see is for the U.S. to walk away. But wow, I mean, we're looking at a situation where the U.S. has not done particularly well for nearly two decades now, and now has to do spectacularly well on its way out. That's it's tough to be optimistic. Andrew, thank you so much for joining us. War and Peace, is a podcast of the International Crisis Group. It's also part of the Europod podcast network. Big thanks to that network and Bull Media that produces it. Thanks to Miranda Sunnox, who makes sure that we know what we're doing when we walk into our home studios. And thanks to all of you, our listeners, for tuning in. And a goodbye from me too. You can find all our work on Afghanistan on our website, crisisgroup.org, under the Afghanistan tab. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.